the nightclub in town that's having more fun than what we're having right here in the house of God. I'm telling you, this is all, you have packed this place uh, to the rafters, which is fantastic. Why don't you be seated, turn to the person next to you and say, you are the best looking thing I've seen all night. <laughs> all right, now turn to your second choice and say, you're better looking than the other person. I was lying. I was actually lying. That's what you need to do. It is our honor to be here. Nick and I, we love your pastors very, very dearly. I mean, um, Pastor Diana and I have kind of, we've become roadie friends over uh, through Propel over the last uh, few months. But you have to thank God that you are planted in such a great church under Pastor Sean and Pastor Diana because they are stellar leaders in our generations. They really are. And um, your house is such a generous house. When I look at what you're doing um, in your community this week, it's just, it makes the heart of God very, very happy. The Bible says that, um, you know, the, uh, that a generous person devises, gener your, your church is one that devises generous things. How, how can I, you know, and the world of the generous gets larger and larger. So don't be surprised why your world is getting bigger um, because any church that is as generous as your house, um, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, which is awesome. Now, I am married to the single most ravishing piece of masculine flesh. <laughs> on planet Earth, and, um, and so we've been married for 20, how long have we been married? <laughs> yeah, it's almost 23, that's why I keep, so, I've, and I'm like all prophetic, so I always go, and I'm an evangelist, so we lie, we always exaggerate, so <laughs> it's uh, 20, 20, you know, by faith, I see it all, it's like, you know, so uh, 22 and a half years, and so it just gets better and better and better, and um, we have two girls, and um, I'll show you, this is my Catherine Bobby, is 16, and my Sophia Joyce is 12. She'll be 13 uh, next month. And um, they, so we've got two kids. Nick is number 14 of 15. Wow. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, there was no television in that part of Australia. And so, um, so his mother did not think you were a woman until you like popped out number 10 or something, you know. And so I would take my daughters to his mum and go, you know, this is Catherine Alpha. And this is Sophia Omega. And this is the beginning and the end of my childbearing years. I didn't pop out my first till I was 35 and my second at 40. So you like need a purple heart if you are popping out a kid uh, at 40. And so you guys have become family. If, in case you don't know, I'm just your crazy Greek aunt from, um, from down the south of this state. And so uh, we live in Newport Beach in Southern California. And so we've been living in America. We actually became American citizens uh, two months ago. So, yes. So I now pledge allegiance to the American flag. One nation. Anyway, no, I won't get there. But I, I, I have a little, I know more about your country than mine. But we're Australian. In case you're wondering what this accent is, this is how the Queen speaks English. Uh, not really, because she's posh. We're the convicts. We got kicked out. And so this is how the convicts uh, speak English. You all threw the tea out in Boston. We kept it. And so we're still part of the monarchy. Thank you, Hamilton. You can tell, uh, you can tell I already love you. We're just like... Uh, you know, and it, it's going to get crazier and crazier and crazier. So we start crazy and then it just gets, it just continues to go at different <laughs> levels. <laughs> so you ought to be in church if you, you know, the only type of a holic that is good to be is a churchaholic. And so um, be, and bring your friends tomorrow. Like it's just going to get more and more cray cray as it goes on. And so uh, bring anyone. It'll be awesome. Every service will be unique. I love church. I walked into church on a Sunday night. And the last Sunday night in January in 1989, I was a mess, a mess. I'd been sexually abused for 12 years. I was left in a hospital unnamed and unwanted when I was born. By the time I was 21 and walked into church, I did not know which way was up. And I walked into a place like this where there was the worship. I didn't know what that was. I didn't come from that kind of tradition. I came from a, a different religious tradition. And um, I, I mean, I thought I walked into a nightclub. I thought it was like a disco. Like, what is going on? Smoke machines, strobe lights, like if someone can give me a joint. But anyway, so I walked into something like this and I'm like, whoa. But then they began to sing like songs. And, and I don't know, all I could say to you is I walked in on the last Sunday in January in 1989 and I never left, and it'll be 30 years in about eight weeks' time, and I, I, I never left. And so to me, I get to do a lot of things in my life, but there's nothing like the house of God, and there's nothing like 
the local church and there's nothing like a night like tonight where you might have come into this place with a friend and you're not even sure whether you just walked into a Monty Python show. They lied. They said, let's go to a club. And you're like, whoa, I've been tricked. Absolutely. And so I want you to know, though, that you're hearing the timing and the plan and the purpose of God. And I was that person that walked in. And so I, I've loved the house of God ever since. But we're going to go to the Bible because we believe that God speaks to us through His Word. And I want you to turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter 6. In Australia, we say Mark. In America, you say Mark. Mark. It's hilarious. Mark. Everyone say Mark. 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 You sound awesome. Everyone say awesome. 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 Now say it like an American. Sailor. <clears throat> Mark chapter 6, verse 30. I'm Greek, Greek and a woman. Don't be freaking out. You will get out on time tonight. So I only speak three ways, hard, fast, and continuously. And so off we go. So the Bible says, The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. They were obviously not from this church because you're... Your pastors always find time to feed us. This doesn't matter what is going on. We could have revival, but we're going to eat. There's no plan. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now, many saw them going and recognized them and ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when he grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the hour is now late. Send them away to go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. Obviously, they had laws that were passed like California many years ago, and so it was just the green grass that they sat on. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and he said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all, and they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces. Everyone say broken pieces. Broken pieces. And um, of... The fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. Say so it was the guys. The guys. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up to the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea and he was on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, so that's about three o'clock in the morning, he came to them walking by the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and, and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were Hardened. I know that's a lot of scripture on a Saturday night. That's potentially more Bible than many of you have read all year, but it's okay. I have just caught you up on your Bible reading plan for the year. So you're, you're going to be okay. You're going to finish for the year. But I love this text. And you go, Christine, why so much scripture? Because we would normally teach these texts in two separate ways. Of course, so many of us, even if you haven't grown up in church life, we, we know the parable of the loaves and fishes. And then, of course, the story about Jesus walking on water to go out to the disciples when they were freaking out in the storm, but you really can't teach these separately because the story starts on the hill where it starts, but it doesn't finish till Jesus gets in the boat and he says, that, well, guys, you actually have no clue what just happened. And so we need to get there. So it starts up on the mountain and the Bible says that the disciples had gone out. They'd been teaching and they'd been teaching and preaching and they came back to Jesus and scripture says they told him all that they had done and all they'd been teaching. See, don't trust anyone that's just out there and under no authority and doesn't come back to their leadership to, to actually say, well, this is what we've been teaching and this is what's been going on. Don't, don't just follow whoever you want. Don't just download any podcast. Don't just go just listening to anyone because even the disciples themselves came back to Jesus and gave an account for everything, Scripture says, that they had been teaching. And they'd done this so much and they'd been working so hard that they didn't have any time to eat. And Jesus knew 
that they needed some time out. Jesus knew they'd been working really, really hard. And it's, you know, like we need to have a balanced life. Everything needs to be really cool. So we're going to get in a boat and we're going to go to the other side. We're going to be by ourselves and we're going to chill. We're going to eat. We're going to rest. We're going to have a few days off because it's all about balance. It's all about not working too hard. It's all about being really cool. So they did that. So they got in the boat. They went to the other side. The only problem is when they got there, Scripture says there were 5,000 men because in those days, that's how you counted. But theologians and commentators would say that if you included women and children, which I love to do, I am a woman, I was a child. So if we include all of them, that there would be a minimum of 15,000, probably closer to 25,000, but let's just go minimum. 15,000 people were waiting. Now, church, I need you to understand, this is before Facebook. This is before Twitter. This is before Instagram. No one said, go and post that Jesus is coming to the other side. There was no mass communication. There was no Fox News. There was no CNN. There was no sort of microphone. There was no way of getting anything out. I need to ask you, church, what was so magnetic? What was so compelling about this man, Jesus, that he said to 12 men, let's go to the other side. When they got there, 15,000 people were waiting. Now, church, I need you to know there was no guest artist. There was no guest speaker. There was a time when we knew Jesus would be in the house. And just because Jesus was going to be in the house, we would turn up and we would be waiting for Him. It was enough. You didn't have to know who was going to be here next Sunday because you knew Jesus was going to be here. Imagine what would happen on the planet if the church actually turned up in numbers because Jesus was going to be in the service just because it was enough that He was going to be there. So He gets there and so much for the roster day off, so much for the balance. So much for the break. Because see, that's how you spell revival. It's called W-O-R-K. It's called work. What happens when the multitudes go, oh, you add another service. You've got to start another campus. But we were going to chill out. We were going to start to rest more. What do you mean we've got to raise up more teams? We've got to do it. Because that's what happens when Jesus turns up to go and rest. The crowd came. Now, the Bible says that Jesus had compassion on them. Now, I run one of the largest anti-trafficking organizations in the world. But I want to tell you this. In our generation, we've confused, confused, we just think compassion is all about social justice and, and it is important. And it's an important element of the gospel without any doubt. But the scripture tells us that Jesus had compassion on them and so he began to teach them many things. I need you to understand in a generation that doesn't think that Scripture is inerrant or doesn't think it's necessary that we open the Word. Jesus puts in the same Scripture as compassion, feeding the poor and marginalized, as opening the Word. Every time we open this Word on Saturday, on Sunday, every time we bring the truth of the Word of God, it's an act of compassion. It's an act of mercy. No wonder you've got a generation that wants to close this book. Jesus says He had compassion on them, so He began to teach them teach them many things. And he goes through and begins to teach them. And of course, they're all freaking out, the disciples, because they know when he starts talking, he doesn't stop. And so they're like, and we don't even understand half of what he's talking about. And so let's go tell him that we need something to eat. And they did what all good leaders do. When you want to get your way with your leader, you go and you blame the people. So they said, Jesus, the people are hungry. Nowhere does it say the people are hungry. We know the disciples are hungry because they had nothing to eat from the beginning of the text. But, you know, we like to blame you. And so they said, Jesus, the people are hungry. We've got to dismiss them. We've got to send them to the Jerusalem mall so that they can get some pita bread and hummus. And so we want the crowds to be big next week. And so we need to send them away. And Jesus turns around and he says, as he would, like, you give them something to eat. Now they do, and they responded to Jesus in the way most of us do, because most of us, we are the answer to our own prayer. But what we think Jesus has said is, why can't you give them anything to eat? See, Jesus never asked a question. He just gave them a command. You give them something to eat. But they answered a question he never asked. They began to give excuses. But we can't. But that's going to take 200 denarii. That's going to take a year's salary. How are we going to be able to do this? We don't have enough. My mother didn't pack an extra lunch for like 15,000. You know, I don't have enough sardines. I don't have enough pita bread. They're giving him all the... We all do that. We all do. I remember when, when I felt a prompting from the Lord to start A21. And so now that's almost 12 years ago when that first thing started. And, and I'm in Greece and, 
you know, when I had this sense that I'm supposed to do something, I thought I need to tell God why I can't because obviously I know He's omnipotent, He's omniscient, He's omnipresent. I know I sing these great songs of majesty to Him, but I lie because really right now He has just asked me to do something and I need to remind Him like, God, I, I can't do this. Because God, I'm, I live in Australia. That's like really far from Greece. God, I, I'm like a woman. God, I just popped out my second kid. God, I just like, you know, I don't have a spare 10 million bucks to, to start a global anti-trafficking organization. God, this is like Russian and Albanian mafia. They kill people. And so God, this is like, you know, when you give the but God, but God, the but list. Moses did that in Exodus chapter three. The Lord said, I, I, I'm gonna set my people free. So I'm gonna send you to do that. And Moses is like, but God, I'm not eloquent and I cannot speak. And God's like, you know, that is the deal breaker on the parting of the Red Sea. How am I going to do that if you can't talk? Can you imagine God in heaven when I'm saying like, but God, I can't do this. I'm a woman. Imagine he's going, like, Peter, Peter, did you know Christine's a woman? When I, uh, uh, why didn't you tell me? Peter, why did you not tell me? Did you know Bartholomew, she just had another baby? Do we have a baby shower up here for that? Why did someone not tell me? Can you tell me, John, get me a GPS. Where is Australia compared to Greece? I'm rusty on my earth kind of GPS. I don't know where that is. I like, I, oh no, I know, I know the stock market's just gone down and Greece is on the verge of economic collapse. What are we gonna do? And I've just asked her to do this. I mean, are we gonna have to pick up some of these gold pavers and send them down to earth? I don't know, what are we going to do? All three of us? Some of you will get it by supper tonight. That's how we treat God. Like he's in heaven going, I had no idea. I did not know what your gender was, what your socioeconomic background was. I did not know what your ability. I had no idea what the economic state of the world is when I asked you to do that. No idea. We're like, but God, but God. You know what we need in the body of Christ? Seriously, we need a serious batectomy. <laughs> it's just above a colonoscopy in the dictionary. Anyway, batectomy. We need to get our big fat butts out of God's face because it's not about what I can't do. It's about who he is and what he wants to do in and through my life. It's not about what we're unable to do. And so they're giving Jesus the excuse. He turns around to them like he always does. Rolls his eyes, I'm sure. And he says, what do you have? Go and see. Because here's the deal. Jesus knew that the ingredients for a miracle are always in our midst. But God cannot multiply what you do not recognize. And so he's sending them back into the crowd to have a look at the ingredients for that relational miracle you need, it's in your midst. The ingredient for that financial miracle, it's in your midst. That ingredient for whatever miracle you need, it's always there. But we don't recognise it, so Jesus can't multiply it. So the disciples go out, and I could imagine Peter with an attitude. Anyone got enough food for 15,000? Anybody? And of course, nobody has. And this is what happens in church every week. Pastor will tell us what a need is and we think, I can't meet all that need. So we think because we can't do everything, we end up doing nothing instead of the one thing that would activate something. Jesus never said, who's got everything? He says, what do you have? Not what has your neighbour got? Not what don't you have? Not what would you give if you had more? He simply says, what do you have? He never asks for what we don't have. He only ever asks for what we do have. So there's one little kid, one little kid that's got five loaves and two fish. His mum packed him a lunch, a couple of sardines, a bit of bread. And he says, well, I, this is what I do have. I haven't got enough for 15,000, but I've got enough for me. And I'm willing to give you the enough that's for me. Isn't that amazing? Now, do you think that was the only person in the crowd that had lunch that day? Oh, no Jewish mother would have sent her kid off without a good lunch or a husband for that matter. <laughs> Unlike me, but she would have sent them off with lunch. But everyone's thinking, I, I can't feed all these people. So I'd rather hang on to the one thing I've got for me rather than give Jesus what he asked for, which is not what's everything, just what have I got? And so... This little boy, now remember the text tells us the 5,000 men were counted that day. 
So isn't it amazing that the ingredients for the miracle came from the hands of the little boy that was uncounted? And what I've discovered in Scripture is God will often use the ones that nobody else counts, the ones that everyone else discounts, the ones that everyone says, you don't count. You're not smart enough. You're not talented enough. You're not rich enough. You're not eloquent enough. You don't count. And God says, oh, I'll take the ingredients from the miracle from the one that everyone else says doesn't count. Do you think when his mother was packing the lunch that morning, she thought she was doing anything so significant that I would be talking about it in Antioch in 2018. You don't know when you're packing the ingredients for a miracle that Jesus is gonna use and do something unbelievable in your life somewhere down the track. Every time you sow a word of kindness, every time you fill your car and you're just driving those, every time you come and serve in church, we go out into the community and serve, you do not know what you're packing that Jesus will be talking about 2,000 years from now, should he tarry. And so he gives the lunch and I could imagine Peter brings it and Peter brings it and drops it at the feet of Jesus with an attitude. See, Jesus, I wish you did it my way, Jesus. If you did it my way, the crowds would now be in the mall. They would have gone to the food court. They would have eaten. They'll come back next week. Tides will be up, it'll be awesome. But no, Jesus, we did it your way. And this is all we've got. We did it your way. We went into a crowd of 15,000 people and we got five loaves and two fish. And I could just imagine Jesus. Wow. Peter, let me, let me just ask you, this is the best that you could do. You went into that crowd and the best you could do in your own strength is five loaves and two fish. Yes, Jesus, that's the best I could do. Jesus is great. I want us to be sure. I want you to recognize what is the absolute best you can do in your own ability. I need you to see that. And he says, so now, Peter, I need you to know that I'm not disqualified from being God because the math doesn't add up. So I know that I've only got five and two and there's 15,000, but I had to wait until it became impossible. I had to wait till you understood there is nothing more that you could do in the natural just so that somewhere down the track you're not going to try to take credit for what I'm about to do. You have to know that the best you can do makes the whole thing impossible. You have to know that this is not able. I need you to know, Peter, the impossibility of the circumstance does not disqualify me from being God. The impossibility of the circumstance is the very thing that activates me into being God because impossible is where God starts and miracles are what God does. The currency of heaven is miracles. We think because it's impossible, God can't do anything. And God's like, I don't even need to turn up till it's impossible. Because if you can do it, you don't need God. So many of the things, I don't think we see the miracles we can see in church yet. Because most of the things we come to God for that we ask miracles for, they're not miracle issues. They're management issues. We come in with God, I need a financial miracle. He's like, no, sweetheart, you need to stop spending more than you earn. <laughs> then when you do that, that's a management issue, not a miracle issue. Oh God, I, I need a health, a miracle. He goes, no darling, you need to stop eating the Krispy Kremes and get on the treadmill. That's what you need. So we're not even seeing miracle activation like we should because most issues in the church are management issues, not miracle issues. Why would God give us more of anything to mismanage if we can't even mismanage and manage what we have now effectively? And so... Jesus is like, this is okay. It's impossible. Now I'm going to show up. I don't know what's impossible in your life, church. I would imagine no doubt there are some people in this room and you're facing, you got an impossible diagnosis this week, terminal, someone you know, a relationship that it just seems it's impossible. News to do with your job or your business and you're like, oh, God, it seems impossible. I need you to know you're poised for a miracle. Because that's where God turns up. God turns up in that impossible situation. And so Jesus takes what was never going to be enough. Five loaves and two fish. It was never going to be enough. He took what was never going to be enough. And Scripture tells us that he blessed it. I wonder what you do with your not enough. 
See, because most of us, we don't, we don't bless our not enough, we curse our not enough, and then we expect God to bless what we've cursed. And so we, we condemn, we don't like where we live, or we don't like our job, or we don't like our relationship. So all we do is murmur, grumble, and complain like the children of Israel in the wilderness. We just murmur, grumble, and complain about our not enough. I hate this house, I hate this car, I can't stand my family, I hate my boss, I don't like my friend. And we just go on. Do you know how much your year would change if you just simply... Began to bless what you're cursing. If you began to say, you know what? This might not be the house that I'm ultimately gonna end up in, but I thank God right now, we've got a roof over our head. This might not be the job that I want ultimately, but I thank God right now. I thank God that we got some food on the table. My marriage may not be where I want it to be, but I thank God we're still working on it. My kids may not be walking with the Lord right now, but I thank God the hound of heaven is out there and He's chasing them and He's gonna bring them back into the house of God. Jesus blessed what was never going to be enough. And then Scripture says, that's not, the miracle hasn't even started yet. The miracle hasn't started because He blessed what was not going to be enough. But the miracle of multiplication did not even begin until He broke it. The miracle is in the breaking. You know that thing that broke you? I wonder if there's anyone in this room besides me that's had something broken in your life. Whether you came from a broken family, whether you had a broken body, whether there was broken finances, whether you had broken relations. I don't know the thing that the devil has told you is gonna disqualify you because it was broken. But I'm here to tell you that it's from the broken fragments of your life that the multitudes will be fed. The multitudes, as Jesus kept breaking, the miracle kept being activating. That thing that you think is gonna kill you, that thing that you've been through that has been breaking you. I want you to know it's not to destroy you. It is gonna be, the thing that God uses to feed the multitudes. Let me tell you, the thing that's feeding the multitudes in my life, it's not my strengths, it's not my gift, it's the broken places. It's the kid that was left in the hospital. It's the abuse and it's the brokenness. Out of that, God is feeding multitudes. Multitudes. The thing that you thought disqualified you is the very thing that if you put it in the hands of a redeeming God, He will feed multitudes from that place. The Bible says He broke it. And then it's interesting. The text takes such an interesting turn at this point. You're thinking everyone by now is hungry. Jesus has blessed it. But then the Bible says, and He broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And He divided two fish. So what He did was, He made them all sit, remember on the green grass? Sitting groups on the green grass and then he gave the broken pieces to the disciple. Have you ever wondered why Jesus would take the time to sit the people down in groups of 50s and 20s and hundreds on the green grass? Why would he do that? I mean, this is Jesus. I mean, he could take, break a piece of bread and he could say to person number 14,963, open your mouth. And I mean, he would have the best baseball arm, sure, it'd be Jesus. But he took time. Do you know how much time it would take to put 15,000 people in groups of 50s or 20s? Like, boom. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, sorry to wake you up, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50. One, two, three, four, five. How long would it, but, but Jesus thought it was important enough while everyone's hungry and the miracle's happening, to take the time to put everyone in groups. Let me tell you why. Because when Jesus is getting ready to pour out a miracle, he always puts in a structure and a system and an infrastructure that's gonna be able to facilitate the miracle that he's about to do. And so he says, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna plant a main campus and then out of that, we're gonna have our small groups and out of that, we're gonna plant other campuses and this is how we're gonna do our women's ministry and this is what we're gonna do with our youth. But but, pastor, what about my vision for the, yeah, yeah. If that's in the heart of God through this house, that'll happen. But right now we're going into groups of 50s and 20s because that's how it's going to look. So right now we get into this scrub shop. And then you've got the people going, hang on a minute. 
What do you mean Jesus distributed the fish and the loaves through the disciples? I, I don't want my fish from Bartholomew. I don't want my fish from Peter. I don't want it from that small group leader. I oh, know. I, I don't want it from that campus pastor. I know, I know their life. I'm smarter than them anyway. Why should I take my fish from them when I could be feeding them the fish? So this is what we do. Oh no. I want my fish straight from Jesus. Hey, but I don't get my fish straight from Jesus. I'm going to go down the road. I'm going to start my own 5 by one c 3 Fish straight from Jesus Ministries Incorporated. And Jesus is like, awesome. I'm not quite sure what you're doing down the road, but the fish that I'm distributing is going out through this system. The fish that's coming from me, see, because I need to know when that fish is going out and it's being distributed through my delegated authority, I, I need to know on who I'm gonna rise up with the future, whether they've got the discernment and the understanding to understand where the fish has come from. It's not so much about who's distributing it, but where the source of this fish from. And if you can't see the source through the distribution system, you're never gonna be able to distribute it yourself down the track. And leader, just because you touched the fish and passed it out, don't think that you had anything to do with making the miracle. The anointing is on the house that you've come through. That's where the miracle comes from. But we have so many people that have touched of the fish and go, oh, it's me. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. I anointed, it came through the house, the house. And so they sat down and scripture says that they all ate. They distributed the fish and the loaves and they all ate and they were all satisfied. And that's normally where we finish this whole story. But the interesting thing is that the story only just begins. Because the power of this text is never in what they ate. It's not the power of this text at all. The power of this text is in what was left over. Because it's interesting that after they all ate, they were all satisfied. Jesus sent the 12 disciples to pick up, Scripture says, 12 basketfuls of broken pieces. Have you ever wondered why? What, broken pieces, like a fish head? Breadcrumbs? Crusts? Why? Couldn't Jesus do the same miracle on the other side? Stick his hand in the Sea of Galilee, go, here we go again, party trick. Couldn't he have done that? Why would he send them? And why would Jesus, who would have been the ultimate master chef, Jesus could have stopped breaking when there would not be one crumb left over. A fine chef in any restaurant is never going to have 12 basketfuls of leftovers. You would never do that. Jesus could have easily finished. But he didn't finish because the point of the text hadn't finished. It was only just now going to start. So the Bible says that he deliberately left 12 basketfuls of leftover. Now, in these days, a basket was uh, like a sack over your shoulder that you carried. And you went and you filled the basket. There was 12 disciples, 12 basketfuls. He wanted each one of them to grab a basketful of leftovers themselves. And then Scripture says that immediately, he said, go and pick up your basketful of leftovers. And immediately, he put them in a boat. And because he's God, he knew he was sending them into a storm. I need you to understand that not all storms are from the devil. Not all storms are from the devil. Some storms God lets you go into and will in fact maybe even send you to so that you can actually find out yourself whether you understood what happened. So what Jesus was doing was saying, I want you to go and pick up a basket full of those broken pieces of the miracle that I just did on the mountain. Because I want you to carry that with you and I want you to put it in the boat because you're about to go into a storm. And I need you to know 
when you're in the middle of that storm because it's okay to shout on Sunday or Saturday at church. But then Jesus sends us into the storm of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And He's basically saying, I need to know whether you understood what happened out there on the mountain. So I want you to take the evidence of the miracle that I did on this mountain. And when you get in the middle of your storm on Tuesday and Wednesday, I need you to look down at those broken pieces. And I need you to understand that the same God that was with you on the mountain is the same God that's with you in the storm, is the same God that's going to take you across to the other side. I need you to hold up your broken pieces. Has God done anything for anybody? Has God saved anybody? Has God delivered anybody? Has God healed anybody? Has God come through? The same Jesus that came through for you there is with you then. You just took your eyes off the broken pieces. He needed you to understand whether you even knew what happened on Sunday at church. Whether you even knew what you were shouting about on Saturday night because the days in which we're going to, it is not enough to partake of the miracles of God on Sunday if you don't know the God of the miracle on Wednesday. And we have a church that loves the miracles of God, but they don't necessarily know the God of the miracle. And we need to be able to take the broken pieces of what happened into the boat of Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, that relational crisis, that financial crisis, that thing that's happening in your life when the devil comes after you, you got to look down and pick up your broken pieces and say, oh no, not today, Satan. The same God that did the miracle over there is the same God that's with me in this boat. So Jesus, sit down. I'm just trying to talk to you. So Jesus puts them into this storm. They don't know they're going into a storm. The disciples, remember, they're like sheep, dumb. That's what we are. And the Bible says that Jesus went up to the mountain to pray, you're like, why did he do that? Because this here, this is the first big miracle. All the miracles before this in the Gospels were like one-on-one miracles. This is the first, after this, Jesus' ministry blows up big time, big time. Because the ingredients for the miracle are in 15,000 stomachs. So he's, they're all about to go and talk. <laughs> and when Jesus is about to blow up your ministry, And God's going to go, okay, this is now the next stage. You want to go on a mountain and get on your face. And so Jesus gets on the mountain and begins to pray. And so Scripture says he's praying. It's fourth watch of the night. It's about three o'clock now. The disciples are straining at the oars. They're wondering. We're now talking. It is, let's just say the miracle finished. If it was dinner time, who knows? I'm just making this up. But say it finished around seven o'clock. We're now at three in the morning. So it only took eight hours after being in this incredible miracle meeting for the disciples to be freaking out. Normally, you might even make it until tomorrow morning before you start freaking out. (laughs) On a really good weekend, we might make it till Monday. But it took them probably about eight hours. Eight hours. They had just seen a miraculous feeding Of 15,000 people, they kept taking the fish and the loaves from the hands of Jesus. See, you can touch the miracle. And eight hours later, not even recognize the miracle maker. And so they were taking it and giving it. Now they're in a boat and the bit of storm came. A challenge comes. Unexpected news comes. An unexpected diagnosis. What's it going to take? What's your eight hour threshold where you've gone from worshiping him to not recognizing him? And so he's looking out and we've all felt that there's these times where you're like, man, it's so dark and you feel so distant and it's so dangerous. But Jesus is watching the whole time. You'd feel like he's gone, but he's watching. And then he's gonna come out to them And it's so so cool when you're Jesus and you're going to come out to them. He doesn't even need to go to the boat shed and hire a boat. He's just like going to walk on water. That's what you do. It's a perk of being God. It's part of the godness. You just get to walk on the very waves that we think are going to drown us. Jesus is like, it's cool. I'm just going to walk over these and I'm going to get to you. But an interesting thing happens. An interesting thing happens. 
He's walking out to them and I'm about to wrap up so I, don't, I forgot to call anyone over, that's okay. So he's walking out to them and here is where the text is fascinating to me. The Bible says they saw him coming. They didn't recognize him and they thought he was a ghost because see what they recognized was the Jesus of the fish and loaves on the mountain. And we get really used to Jesus doing things in a certain way. But you see, in the middle of the storm, we didn't need loaves and fishes. We didn't need that kind of miracle. And when God's doing a new thing and it's a new circumstance and it's a new day, He's gonna come out in a different form. But if you are not perceptive, you might think the very God that's coming to rescue you is actually a ghost coming to destroy you. This was not a ghost coming to destroy them. This was Jesus coming in a different way into the storm of their circumstance to rescue them. It's just that they hadn't seen that Jesus before. They didn't know that Jesus. And Jesus gets in the boat. Yeah. The Bible says in the New King James, he was so disappointed, not because they were freaking out, but because they had not understood the miracle yeah. of the loaves and the fishes. And we have so many in our churches that don't understand what it is that God is doing don't even understand who Jesus is. We come and we go through the motions, but we don't even know. So then we have a political change and we freak out. Wall Street falls and we freak out. Something happens around us and we freak out because we never understood what was going on. It never was about the condition of the economy. It wasn't even about the political situation. It never had anything to do with that. It always was about Jesus. It always will be about Jesus. It will always continue to be about Jesus. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell cannot, shall not, will not prevail against the church of the living God. We don't have to freak out no matter what is happening, economically or politically or socially or morally. We do not need to leave our bearings. The same God that brought us here is the same God that's gonna take us there. It always was Jesus. It always will be Jesus. See, some of us, we are so good with now. Man, we're cool, aren't we? Got our buildings, got our churches, got our relationships. We got everything we want, so we think. We try to hang on, man. Haven't been in faith for years. We gave our five loaves and two fishes when, when we had nothing. But I wonder when was the last time you really gave the equivalent of five loaves and two fish? I remember the miracle I needed for the first day 21 office. Well, we're now we're opening our 16th and I'm always challenged. Chris, are you on the edge as much? Because see, now I've got more to protect. Now, now I, I can pretend to look good because it's also managed beautifully, but I haven't actually been in faith for 12 years if I'm not careful. If I'm not careful to go, it always was Jesus. See, we're good with now. But the truth is, now's not where my confidence is. Man, A21 governments could decide you, you got to leave the country. They could decide in a heartbeat. No, we don't want this. It's shut down. Imagine if I just got confident with now. Churches, ministries, laws could change in nations. I might not even be able to preach like this. I might not get invited to it. Now is not where my confidence is. No, 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 no. My confidence is with back then, see. When the devil comes, I don't talk about, wow, I'm Chris Kane, I run A21, I'm a pre. I don't talk about now. I go, no, 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 devil. The same Jesus, when I was in that hospital, unnamed and unwanted, the same Jesus that was with me then, that's the same Jesus that's with me now. When I was nobody in the back of Australia and God plucked me out of anonymity and obscurity, the same God that picked me up then is the same God that is with me now. The same God that kept me through 12 years of abuse and healed me and made me whole. That same Jesus that brought me here is the same Jesus that will take me there. It's not about systems. It's not about comfort. It always was Jesus. It always will be Jesus. Jesus is the one that has done it all. It's always Jesus. Friend, I wonder, I wonder if you know this Jesus that I'm talking about. Not, not do you know about Him, but do you know Him? It is not enough that we know about the miracles of God if we don't know for ourselves. The God of the miracles, see, you can't take this away from me. 
It doesn't matter what happens politically anywhere on the earth. I've got offices in 15 countries. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what happens economically. I'm in the most affluent nations and the most poorest nations on earth. Because that's not ever what sets the standard for me. Jesus does. Whatever happens, Jesus. Jesus. And if we're to understand the miracle of the loaves and fishes, we don't get too cool for school as we go on. It's always Jesus. I wonder if you know Him. And if you don't right here, right now on this Saturday night, I wanna give you the opportunity to address the spiritual condition of your heart, the opportunity to put Jesus Christ first in your life. Friend, whether a friend invited you here for the first time tonight or maybe you once walked with God or if you're honest tonight, you've been away from God cold in your heart. Friend, I wanna invite you to stop running from Him, come back to Him. Make your peace with Him. Put Jesus Christ first in your life. Friend, you were created by God for a relationship with God. And it's Jesus that connects us to God. And it's Jesus that connects us to the grace of God. I want every head bowed and every eye closed in this room, friend, from the front to the back, from the left to the right in this moment. I'm not speaking to the person next to you. I'm speaking to you, whether this is your first time in church or your hundredth time. I'm speaking to you. I'm not asking you if you go to church or if you're religious. I'm asking you, do you know the God of the miracle? Do you know Jesus? And if you don't right here, right now, I wanna give you the opportunity to address the spiritual condition of your heart, the opportunity to put Jesus Christ first in your life. If you say, Chris, I want what you're talking about today. The same Jesus that took this unnamed, unwanted, abused, adopted girl from the back of Sydney, Australia, wiped away the mess of her past, gave her a brand new start and a hope for the future. The same Jesus that did it for me is in this room tonight, friend, ready to do it for you. If you say, Chris, I want that. I need a fresh start with Jesus Christ. Either for the very first time or I've been away from Him, cold in my heart, but I want what you're talking about tonight. I want a fresh start with Jesus. Friend, let me pray for you. Just a very simple but powerful prayer right where you're sitting. If you say, Chris, include me in that prayer. I want a fresh start with Jesus Christ tonight. Would you just raise your hand so that I know who I'm praying for in this moment? Thank you. I'm seeing hands go up everywhere. Keep those hands go up. Beautiful, beautiful. Keep those hands going up. I'm seeing you in every section of the room. Just keep your hand up high. Keep your hand up high. And I'm going to pray a prayer. Every person in this room is going to pray this prayer out loud after me. I want you to keep your hand up high if you're praying this prayer though because this is your sign to God. The rest of us are gonna pray this out loud in agreement with conviction as believers. But there are so many of you with your hands raised. We're gonna pray this as you say yes to Jesus. So church, let's pray this together. Dear Jesus, I've raised my hand tonight because I recognise my need for you. I ask that you would forgive me for all of my sins, that you would give me a fresh start tonight and I hope for the future. I wanna be a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ.